Hello, welcome to York Street. We hope that this sermon will be an inspiring and impactful one, just what you need at this time. For any of our sermon-based studies, please head to our website at www.yorkstreet.com.au. So grab a cuppa, grab your notebook, whatever you need, and we hope that you enjoy the sermon. Today we continue our series called The King and I. I remember as a 17-year-old, I had an incredible opportunity to travel with a group of missionaries on a short-term missionary trip. And we were situated in India a few weeks into this trip, and I had the the privilege and honour to speak in front of quite a large group of people. And I remember in that space that, that I knew I was where God wanted me to be, but the nerves and the fear and the anxiety of speaking in front of this group really got to me, so much so that my, my breathing was staggered. I couldn't take a clear breath in. It was like that <laughs> little bits, and, and my, my knuckles were white, my hands were pasty, and, and, and my feet were, my legs were all shaky. I remember just thinking, like, I'm not going to be able to even stand up, let alone speak and read from scripture and, and do what I had to do through an interpreter. And, and I remember in that space just, just praying, God, I need, I need you now. And something urged me, I don't know why, but, but I had a bag next to me, and in, in my bag was my Bible. And so in the midst of the, the whole proceedings, I've reached down and grabbed my Bible, and in this space of anxiety, I've opened up to uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 10, and and I don't need my Bible for it because I've memorized the passage. It meant that much to me. And in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 10, it says, If Timothy comes, which is a great introduction to get your attention if you're nervous and your name's Tim. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he's with you, for he's carrying on the work of the Lord. And it goes on just a verse later. It says, Send him on his way so he may return to me. And, and I was a little bit homesick at the time too. But what that did in that moment of fear and anxiety was God showed himself to be bigger than the fear and anxiety and, and showed in a very real way to me as a, as a teenager that God is with me when I'm in a space for him. And what took place was, was there was this moment of the things that ruled my life in that space were, were, were fear, anxiety, and God's rule had, had diminished because the, the physical was so, so overpowering, even though my spirit wanted to do the right thing. And it wasn't until I, I reached out to God and gave this, this thing to God that, that God stepped in. And God's rule in that space became sovereign. And, and it doesn't matter how the talk went. What, what's so important about that moment was that God showed himself and I submitted myself to God's kingship and did what he called me to do. I think there's times in life when we have things that rule us. For me, in that moment, it wasn't so much a fear of public speaking, while that, while that played its part, but it was actually a fear of people. I was afraid that I was going to let down the team that I was with as their ambassador and let down them. We were representing a denomination within Australia and I thought I was going to let down the entire denomination or the entire country and I was wearing this fear of of people's ideas and understanding I thought what if I don't communicate well and what does that mean for those people that are that are watching and my fear was of people and not of God not that it was a a a fear of God smiting me or hurting me but a fear of, of respecting God with the best I had and this fear ruled me instead of submitting to God's loving rule and what God met me there was with love. I wonder what rules your life. Is it money? Is it family? Is it work? Is it fame? Is it social media? Is the idea of of what your expectations of others on you? Is it it a fear of the current season we're in? What what things rule your life? We're going to call these things that rule our life today giants. 
And I wonder how you can face up to these giants in a way that we can honor God and allow God to be the hero in the story of how you defeat the giants in your life. Let's pray before we dive into God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you would lovingly meet us the same way, way that you met that young Tim as a 17-year-old with words of encouragement and affirmation. Lord, I pray that you would meet, meet each and every one of us in a place of love and affirmation as we face the giants that we deal with sometimes each and every day, but sometimes they are mighty giants that we need to face and conquer once and for all. So God, meet us in that place of love. Meet us in that place of support as we face our giants today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you know scripture, if you've been uh, a Christian for a while, or maybe you just know this story, we are talking about a giant in scripture, a giant called Goliath, as we journey through the story of David. And we see that these times in Scripture are are quite different to today. Actually, this time or passage in Scripture, these are incredibly violent, and in the true sense of the word, bloody times, as war was an incredible um, bloody place in in that people were bleeding everywhere. Actually, it, it got to the point where after the battle you would have to check yourself to see if the blood that was on you was yours or someone else because the adrenaline was pumping so much in the heat of battle that you didn't realize that you were getting hurt. And if you got a a mark or a cut or anything, chances are that that cut may not kill you, but the infection that would ensue would. So much so that that I was researching around this and one of um, Andy Stanley's references to the war time was that, that... often the soldiers wouldn't wear a lot of clothes because the risk of having the fibers of the cloth pressed into you if you got a a battle scar was so great that there was a higher chance of infection and then, of course, death. And so when we read in Scripture of mighty warriors, this this is something to take note of. So a little bit later in the story, to to keep with the the David um, theme, later on in Scripture we see that that there's praises of David slaying his tens of thousands. This is a mighty warrior. So if you've got someone that can slay tens of thousands, thinking that, that one wound may mean death, shows that, man, this is somebody that I want to follow. This is someone that's going to protect me. And so these are, are, are different times in history where war and battle and brutality are normal. Now, the, the armies at this time are far worse than what we see God's people. God's people show grace. God's people don't want to always wipe out the whole enemy. And we see that through examples of um, different racial groups that follow God. And we see them echoed all the way through the Old Testament. However, these are still war-torn and terrible times. And so we see what takes place is one of these battles that is sort of a rhythm of life, sadly, in these times. And we see in 1 Samuel chapter 17, from verse 1, we're going to skip over some of the verses, but we'll get the, the main part of the passage. We see there, the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soka in Judah. Now, we've actually got a picture of this place in, in current times. You can see it's used for, for cropping and farming. But you can see that there's a valley, there's two hills, and in the middle there's a, there's a valley, and they, they set up the main camps on the hills because they're easy to defend from um, sneak attacks. But then they would fight in the valley and they would draw their battle lines, so two big lines of soldiers. And then the custom was then to save life because life is still precious and you don't want all of your soldiers to get wiped out. They would send uh, uh, the best soldier out to battle. And whoever won the battle would then, uh, the other side would surrender. And that was a way of saving life because life is precious, um, but also having their their battles and, and fights. Not always, but but often that was the case. So we see a champion in verse 4 named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out to the Philistine camp. 
His height was six cubits in span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale and bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels, between sort of 50 to 70 kilograms. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung to his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and the iron point weighed 600 shekels, about seven and a half kilos. His shield bearer went ahead of him. And so we see this mighty warrior, about nine foot tall, with huge, heavy armor, a seasoned warrior, He's the ambassador for the Philistines to come out and fight God's people. In verse 10, the Philistines said this, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now Saul's the king. Saul, remember he was tall, good looking, he was a warrior. Saul and his entire army are dismayed, that they're staggered just by the presence of this soldier. Totally dismayed and terrified to the point where we actually read a little bit later that they withdrew, they ran away. And this is the entry point. Now God's chosen king, Saul, which we knew just before he's been disowned because he hasn't followed God. But we see the fear is outweighing their understanding of God, that the rule of God in their life is so outweighed by, by the other elements of life weighing down on them. What we then see is that David, who, we, who has been anointed king, but no one else knows it yet. This is sort of the, the secret um, anointing that Samuel did. God has chosen David as king, and David, remember, is filled with the Spirit. So David now has this Holy Spirit in him. He's got this, he knows how he can then have a boldness. He's got this relationship with God, and we see, excuse me, he enters into the story here. And so David's father sends some food to his brothers who are in the army. And so David gets some food and goes there and, and brings the food to the storehouse and he's, he's having a conversation with the, the manager of the storehouse there and he overhears this chant that Goliath had been doing time and time again each and every day. The, the, the battle lines would be drawn up, Goliath had come out, he'd, he'd yelled defiance against Israel and Israel had, had run away and flee. Now what starts to take place is David starts hearing this and goes like, what, what's going on? And he sees in verse 34 that the, the Israelite army are, are fleeing. And David doesn't understand this. So the first thing he does, is he starts to ask some questions. In verse 26, David asks the men standing there, what will be done if the person it kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace from Israel? There's a righteous anger, a righteous confusion about what's going on here. Uh, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? What, what is this scenario? It doesn't make sense to David. And so he starts to ask all these questions. Now today, as we, we read this passage, we're going to have an acronym of HERO. And, and the first thing that you've got to understand when you're facing your giants is you've got to hear what is ruling your life. You've got to hear what the giant actually is. When I was in India, you could have thought that the giant was public speaking, but it wasn't. On deeper examination, it was actually a deep desire for me to, to do well and please other people. And I had to surrender that to, to please God first in, to be actually able to get up and speak at all. And so David here is doing the right thing in hearing what the problem was. He starts asking questions to the people at the store, storehouse. But even in the midst of hearing, sometimes we hear different voices. And that's exactly what happens. In verse 28, Elam, David's older brother, remember, he'd been overlooked. Samuel thought he was the one, but no, no, he's not the one. He heard him speaking with the men, and he burned with anger and asked, why have you come down here? 
And with whom did you leave all those few sheep in the wilderness? I know you're conceited and how wicked your heart is. You've come down here only just to watch the battle. David replies, what have I done? Can't I even speak? And then he turned to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the man answered. You see, sometimes when we're trying to hear what the giant is, we're hearing the issue, there's competing voices. And in that, we see that, that the opposition voice here actually sounded quite fair. Are you just here to watch the battle? Who's looking after the sheep? What's your responsibility? And David could have heard that and quite justifiably turned, out, turned away and went back to look after his sheep just to prove his brother wrong, to show that I'm not here to watch the battle. I'm just here to deliver the food. I was asking questions, but I'll prove you wrong. I'm going to go back. You see, H is for hearing the true issue. We then see that upon David's understanding of this, goes, well, well, God's got this. I'll, I'll do it. I don't see what the big deal is. Remember, David's anointed, and he's, he's got this portion of the Holy Spirit, but even, even then, it's like, I still wrestle with how, how eager David is to put his hand up in this moment. He goes, well, I'll fight the giant. And he gets taken to Saul, the king. And Saul says, but Saul hears that there's this guy that said yes to, to fighting the battle and invites him in as expecting this warrior, but instead gets this shepherd boy. And now David has to defend himself. And he talks in verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it and struck it down. And David goes on to defend himself saying, I've killed lions, I've killed bears, God's been with me, and this giant is just the same as those. Let me do it. You see, David's understanding of God's rule over the the rule of people was so much greater. And in that, the Saul goes, well, I'll give you some armor. And he goes, I can't even move. No, no, no. God's got this. Such incredible faith that we see. But in that, wouldn't the tension be just to put on the armor anyway, just to be safe? Yes, we'll go into battle, but, but I just want a bit of a safety net. You see, first thing, we've got to hear the issue. The second thing we've got to do is we have to embrace God's plan. We've got to hear the issue and understand what it is, but we have to embrace God's plan. For David, embracing the plan meant that he wasn't going to wear armor. Embracing the plan meant that he had to do like what God had called him to do. Now, there's all sorts of warriors and stuff, but everyone had ran away. It wasn't the normal way of fighting. And we heard the whole description of what the normal way looked like with the huge armor and spear and javelin and sword and shield bearers. You see, often the shield bearers would go before the soldiers and the shield bearers would do that. They would bear the shield. And then these mighty warriors would stand behind and height is a thing. Remember, we've talked about that already. And and so these Goliath, this giant with this huge weaving size rod with this huge spearhead would stand behind the shield bearer as the, the, the soldiers would come together in those circumstances and as they come together with their shields they would just stand over and just destroy and destroy and destroy. This is a seasoned warrior. This is the way war was back in those days. But David embraced a different way when he understood and heard what God's plan was. Saul says to David, go and the Lord be with you. We then see in verse 40 that that he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the stream and put them in his pouch of his shepherd's bag. What has he got? He's, He's a shepherd. So he puts him in his shepherd's bag. He's got no armor, no warrior-like things. He's embraced God's plan of who he's been called to be in that moment. And with his sling in his hands, he approached the Philistine. First, we've got to hear the plan. We've got to embrace, we've got to hear the issue. 
embrace God's plan. But the, the third thing, and the aff in hero, is what is your role? We've got to understand our role. David didn't just stand back and go, yep, the battle belongs to the Lord. Off you go, Lord, you do it. David actually had to had a role in this, had some actions that he had to put into place. He couldn't just sit back. And so for David, he had to go to the stream and had to choose carefully. Nope. Nope. Hmm. Oh, maybe. No, no, this one's better. No, no. And he chose carefully five smooth stones. Now, I've heard it said before that, you know, David didn't have all that much faith because he chose five stones, which is, I think is a bit of a, an odd argument when you see an entire army of seasoned soldiers and the king, who was a warrior king, um, in Saul all running away, um, the little shepherd boy. I think it's not bad faith. But if you read around Scripture too, and I'll leave this as a bit of homework if you're interested in it, um, see how many giants there were. There's a couple of different trains of thought on this, but um, one of the trains of thought is that Goliath had four brothers. Five giants, five stones. I'll leave that with you. Getting back into this, so, the, so David embraced his role and did the action to defeat the giant that he was about to face. We then see Goliath get up there and, and they're, they're on the battlefield now and we see this picture where there's the, the two hills and there's the two lines of soldiers and then out from the lines are, are the, the two soldiers and, and in, this, in the lines where the soldiers are that we see that they're now yelling at each other. And, and Goliath, seeing that it's just this boy with a stick, says, who is this that comes out with a stick? So, you know, is this a dog? Like, I'm going to feed his body to the wild animals. And, and, and of course, you know, this is the same sort of defiance that he's been yelling at the whole time, and Israel's petrified. But this is David's reply. You come against me, in verse 4, 45, with sword and spear and javelin, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Remember the idea of hearing and embracing. He embraced that the plan was just to come before him in the name of God. Not with weapons, not, not as an expert warrior, but just as a boy because God would be glorified in this. I come against you. In the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defied. On this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down and I will cut off your head. This day, I am given, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those gathered here, these two armies, that there will be witness that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands as the Philistine moved closer to attack David. Get this. So they've yelled at each other. David said, if this wins, you know that there's a God. Captive audience, both sides. The Philistine moves in to attack David and get this. Verse 48, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. David ran towards his giant. I don't know about you, but I'm not in a hurry to face my giants. I, I, I stand back a little bit or, or I, I analyze it or I get some help sometimes. Giants aren't fun. They're scary. Yet we see the faith of David. He runs towards his giant, reaching into his bag. He took out the stone and slung it, and it sunk into the Philistine's forehead. It goes on to say that the stone sunk into his forehead and, and killed him, and the Philistine fell over dead. And then, to be true to his word, David then ran over, runs over and grabs the sword and cuts off his head. And the Philistine army flees, and the Israelites chase after them, and and the victory is God's. And all the way through, even to the very end of the story, you see David says that the, the victory is God's. The, the, the victory is all about God. You, you see, when 
we face our giants for God. See, the O in hero is that the outcome, the outcome honors God. You see, when we talk about giants and heroes, we're not the hero. You see, when we, we face our giants and we do it in a God-honoring way, God is the hero in the narrative because God is the one that has the victory. In this story, we see that the giant is defeated not by David's ability, but by God. David was, was a vessel, and yes, David did his bit, but it was God that won the victory. And to David's incredible credit, he, he says that it's God. He, he points to God, even when he, they try and build him up and give him honor and glory. He says, no, it's not mine. It's God. It's God. It's God. You see, when we, we talk about heroes, God is the hero. And the outcome honors God. Now, the one thing about this incredible part of history that I wrestle with is that part where David runs towards the giant. Like, what, inc- what an incredible man of God. Like, if you're talking about the greatest king that Israel ever had, that's the kind of king you want. That even as a boy, he runs towards the greatest opposition that the nation can see, let alone becoming a warrior king that, that is able to defend his nation. Like, wow, this is an incredible king running towards his giants. But I know sometimes <sighs> facing a giant's tough because... Facing a giant may mean that I need to change, may mean that there's some discomfort, may mean that there's an inner wrestle, and we're so blessed that our Lord Jesus Christ showed what it was to wrestle when it comes to facing our giants. You see, Jesus, when he was facing his giant, he did it, but there was a reluctancy, and today's message is called The Reluctant Hero. And what I love is Jesus showed us how to honor God in a way that God is the the hero when facing the giants, letting God's rule outweigh the rule that that we have in life. You see, there's this, this moment in Jesus' life before he goes to the cross where he's wrestling with this. There's a reluctancy in what he's about to do. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, found in Matthew chapter 26, we see that Jesus offers this prayer, and he says in verse 42, he went away a second time and prayed, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, lest I drink it, may your will be done. May your will be done. If it's not possible for it to be taken away. Now, what's he talking about with this cup? The cup was the cup of the new covenant, the blood of the new covenant, his life. If it is not possible for my life to be spared, if there's no other way, your will be done. You be glorified. You be honored. Just before it, when he's talking to his disciples, he says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. As he's encouraging them, asking them to pray for him in this moment. He's saying, the spirit, I know what I have to do, but the flesh, the fear, the, the reluctancy, the anxiety, the fear... See, when you face your giants, it's not always head on, running straight into battle. Sometimes there's fear, anxiety. The spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, in in Scripture, we get this picture of when we submit to God's rule, we've got to let go. We've got to face the giants in our life. For David, the giant was simple. It was a giant. It was a big dude with, with weapons and they were doing terrible things to God's people. The Philistines were a terrible, terribly violent nation. And, and they had to win this victory. And in doing so, not just defeated the giant, but broke the spirit of the Philistines and showed God's power and, and allowed God to do so many other things through David. As David, it, you know, early on and later on, submitted to God's rule. And as we heard over communion, he messed up and he let the rule of the world in for a bit and he never lived that down. We'll hear about that later in the series. But, but, but he, he asked for forgiveness and, and rightfully allowed God to take kingship over his life once again. 
You see, for me, it was a fear of people, a fear of letting people down, a fear of obligation, a fear of opinions as a 17-year-old sharing a message. And for Jesus, you see, the giant that Jesus faced was sin. Sin, not just, not his sin at all, because he never sinned, but the sin of all humankind. You see, when, when Jesus was wrestling with this, he, he heard the issue. And he heard it long before he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus heard the issue of sin and, and this, this thing that was separating the creation of humanity and God. And he heard it when he was in heaven. And he knew that God had a plan. And, and he, he, he embraced God's plan so wholeheartedly that he came down to earth. And he came down to earth and lived this perfect life knowing that he had a role to play in this and the role would actually cost him his life. But in doing that, he, he, he was honoring God with the outcome of that sacrifice and the hero of the narrative was that a loving God restored his creation back into relationship through his son. I believe that each of us have something to offer when it comes to fighting the battles against our hero. We've got three things. The first thing is taken from the example that Jesus made for us. Jesus gave his life. And when we become a Christian, when we, we say, God, I invite you into my life, what, we, what we're saying is that, that I want to die to my old self and be born again. The same way Jesus died on the cross and rose again. And each and every day we make a decision to die to self, to, to this wrestle of what rules our life, saying, I'm going to die to this so you can be ruler over my life. And in doing that, we sacrifice our own desires for God's desires. And allow God to be king over our life. So the first thing that we have to offer when facing our giants is our life, ourselves. The second thing that we can offer when it comes to, or use as an incredible tool when it comes to fighting these battles, is the thing that God placed in my hand when I was a 17-year-old. You see, in Exodus chapter 4, Moses is told, what's in your hand? Because Moses is making all sorts of excuses when it comes to fighting the battle. All sorts of excuses. Moses is, is being called to, to fight this inner wrestle of going back to Egypt where he just ran away from and to lead his people out of slavery. That was Moses' giant. And God asks Moses, what's in your hand? And he goes, it's a staff, like it's a shepherd staff. I don't know. I guess that's what you do with a staff. I'm not quite sure. But it's a staff. And through what he had in his, his hand, God used that for mighty things. The, the staff turned into a serpent. It, it brought water out of the, the rock. It, it, it parted the, the Red Sea. It, it, it won battles. This staff did incredible things because it's what was in his hand. You see, Jesus said, take this cup. What was in Jesus' hand? Well, the cup was his life. And he gave it to fight the battles. As a 17-year-old, this is what I had in my hand. God's word. And as I've already said, it, like it was, I was so blessed as a, as a young teenager that the actual words were, were my name, but your name is in this book. And the instructions for how to defeat your giants is in this book. God is with you when you face your giants. God, God is for you when you face your giants. And when you face your giants, for God, God is the hero in the story. And you get to be a part of that. But more than that, we also see that David had something in his hands. And it wasn't something when he compared himself to others. It wasn't that he would compare himself to the other soldiers and stuff. The thing that David had in his hands were the skills and the, the, the tools of the trade that he was in in that moment in life. Five stones and a staff. I wonder what you have in your hand Firstly, there's as saved, being Christians, as being saved, you've got your life to offer God as you face the giants. As Christians, we're so blessed to have God's word, to see what God has to say in these different situations, to see this loving story of reconciliation, of grace and mercy, and how to, to restore people's relationship with God in all circumstances, in all walks of life. 
But God has also given you gifts and abilities, skills and talents. You know, if you're a musician, use music. If you're a creator, create. If you're good with maths, do that thing that I'm not good at with maths. You know, use whatever you've got in your skills to honor God. Don't limit yourself because you think, well, who am I? Because a shepherd boy delivered a nation. God has a plan for you to face your giants, and he has equipped you with your life, his word, and some incredible skills and abilities. I want to challenge us. What's in your hand? How can God become the hero of the narrative? But more than this, how can you face your giants this week so that the king and I can be where we're meant to be, the king and you, in our relationships this week? As we prepare to pray, I want to just offer some assistance because we do life together. Yeah, we're facing giants, and some of them are going to be inner giants that maybe we don't want others to know. Others are giants that we, we do need some help with. Uh, I want to encourage you just to, to flick an email to the office, to the prayer group, and just title it, this is the giant that you want to face. And in that, we'll, um, we'd love to, to be in contact and be praying for you as you face your giant this week, but also be able to be um, supporting you in and through that. But let's pray as we wrestle with how we can be reluctant heroes in the narrative of the king and our relationship with him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son, that Jesus just didn't hear the master plan, but he embraced it so wholeheartedly that he came to earth. He fulfilled his role and in his obedience to that role, He honored you with the outcome of the narrative and defeated sin once and for all. God, there are things in our life that rule us more than you, things that take your space in our lives as king over who we are. God, as we face these giants, as we face these things that rule over us, we ask that we would be filled with your spirit, that we would give ourselves and our lives over to you, that we would use your word as a mighty tool, as a mighty sword to to find comfort and enrichness and strength and wisdom, but also that we would use the incredible abilities and skills and passions that you have given each and every one of us by design to be able to defend our faith and to fight off the giants that take your place in our life. God, we pray that as we fight off the giants this week, that you would become the hero of our narrative. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this message. We hope that it was inspiring and powerful and just what you needed at this moment. If you would like prayer or to find our sermon-based studies, please head to our website or check the description below for a link. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to share the video, like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for updates of when we release new videos. Remember, life can be tough, so let's do it together.